Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today and for, once again, another opportunity to dig into your word and uh, re receive from you, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would um, allow uh, the, your words to be shared and allow the words from this chapter, uh, Lord, to, to speak to each of us uniquely and individually. I'm sure there may be some mention of a word or a, a scripture um, that most likely will mean something specific in, uh, and interesting to us that maybe we'll want to look into it a little bit more after the study or it'll just be something that we can say wow thank you lord for that word thank you for uh, what you've done in preserving your word for so many a couple thousand years now lord it's just uh, amazing that we still have your word intact and complete and uh, lord how we're going to learn that men and women so many thousands of years ago or are still so similar to the way we are now culture back then was so similar to the way it is now. Um, so Lord, help us to learn from possibly past mistakes and uh, make better choices and decisions going forward. Uh, we again thank you for the men here in this room that were able to make time in their schedules to be here. And Lord, we pray for those men that weren't able to for one reason or another to, to be here tonight. Lord, I pray that they'll be watching this video maybe online uh, in, the, in the near future and still get a blessing of uh, hearing from you. Pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have Habakkuk chapter 1. Um, so it seems like I always get the privilege, I guess, of starting off a new book. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an overview of Habakkuk. I have a, um, there's a, yeah, I'll show a slide here in a little bit, but maybe while I'm talking about it, I'll just show it now, just so while I'm talking, you can kind of see this in the background. Um, myself and Steve have been able to use this graphic, I think, for several different teachings now, uh, just because it's a pretty decent timeline of all the different um, prophets we've been talking about, uh, and maybe a king of Judah or a king of Israel that we've been able to talk about. So the big white arrow there is pointing to Habakkuk. So you can see the, the prophets that are what I call contemporary or live roughly in the same time frame as Habakkuk. So in the green area there where, you, where the arrow is pointing to Habakkuk, that's kind of his time of um, prophesying. So before that and a little bit after that probably um, is you know his lifespan. So his lifespan may have gone back maybe as far as Zephaniah, but certainly to Nahum and Obadiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel and Ezekiel. He would, all these prophets were somewhere in the countryside, all wandering out, around at the same time. Some during their uh, time of ministry and others not. Uh, but you can see also, I, I was just kind of surprised by the, the length of time we see Jeremiah and Daniel um, working as God's instruments. Uh, so during the, my teaching today, I'm going to actually mention um, Daniel uh, a little bit. Uh, because it's actually pointing to uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, in a portion of chapter 1. And Nebuchadnezzar is spoken of in the book of Daniel, chapter 4. So I'll be going there to read a couple of scripture passages. So I'll kind of also look at the timeline. Uh, Habakkuk, roughly 630 um, B.C. to 600 B.C. So this is well before the conquering of Jerusalem which if you scroll to the right on the map, 586 B.C., you can see the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. Um, one of the uh, destructions there, I guess, uh, there was like three different instances where Jerusalem was attacked, but the final devastation happened, uh, the time frame is pretty much agreed upon around 586 B.C. Um, so, with that in mind, and while I'm talking about the overview, you can keep looking at that, just kind of listening and trying to let the time frames and the people kind of get solidified in your mind. But Habakkuk was a unique among the prophets in that he liked to ask the Lord questions. Uh, many of these other prophets, you know, they were actually prophesying, and that's kind of what their books were about. But Habakkuk, we're going to see in chapter 1 especially, is he's got two big, main, poignant questions that he actually asks to the Lord. So he's actually trying to almost engage a dialogue with the Lord. And if, at least in my study Bible, the way chapter one is kind of broken up, it's um, basically Habakkuk asking a question. So Habakkuk's first question, and then the Lord's reply. 
and then Habakkuk's second question, and then the Lord's reply. Um, so he's got two main questions that he's going to be asking of the Lord. Same questions, believe it or not, that we would ask today. So this is 2,600 years ago, Habakkuk was asking these questions, and they're still relevant today. So what are those questions? Uh, go back to another slide. Basically, why does the evil in Judah go unpunished? Habakkuk is in Judah, so that's specific. But another way of be asking that same question is, or why do the wicked prosper? Uh, there's many other instances or where this question kind of comes up in Scripture. I'm um, going to be going to another passage of Scripture um, where Asaph in Psalms, Psalm 73, uh, asked the same question. So we'll be reading a passage from there as well. So why does evil continue to go unpunished, or why do the wicked prosper is one question uh, that's just weighing on Habakkuk's mind. And then the second question is, how can a just God use a wicked nation like Babylon to punish his chosen people? So in chapter 1 specifically, God is going to be telling Habakkuk, I know you can't understand why things are going on like this, but I'm, here's my answer. I'm gonna, you, you guys have done wicked things too, but I'm going to actually use a more wicked nation to punish you. Yes, you're my chosen people, but justice has to prevail. And God is going to be uh, using the wicked Babylonians uh, to do this. So those are the two main questions. So Habakkuk, Habakkuk wanted to know, just as we do, what God was doing and why. The big why question. Why are you doing this, Lord? I don't understand. That's going to be my preview to my life lesson. It's a life lesson I've used before. I won't tell you what it is now because it's the very last slide. But... It's alluding to, you know, why is God doing what he's doing? Bang. That's the big question. There seems to be too much evil uh, among the righteous and too much freewheeling power among the wicked is also something that Habakkuk kind of brings up in verses <coughs> probably 3 through 5. And so doesn't that sound familiar? Let me read this again. There seems to be too much evil lurking around the righteous. So there are righteous people scattered around our community, our city, our state, our world. But among those righteous, there just seems to be so many more wicked people or evil people. And too much freewheeling power among the wicked. Why do the wicked seem to have so much more power or influence uh, among the communities that they live in? And this was happening again in Habakkuk's time as well. So God did not strike down Habakkuk for asking these questions. He actually engages in these conversations. Sort of, it kind of sounds like a dialogue. Um, so the Lord, he answered uh, in Scripture. Uh, we're going to see, see his reply. Um, but it's good to note that the Lord will establish his kingdom. He will hold all people and all nations accountable. And that's kind of God's main underlying point. He doesn't get mad at Habakkuk for asking these questions. He just says, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Here's my answer. This is the judgment that's going to come, and this is how I'm going to deal out the judgment. I'm going to use these wicked Babylonians, um, and here's sit back, listen, and watch. We know that, uh, very little about this prophet, prophet Habakkuk. Um, the designation of prophet, we're going to see here in verse 1, um, at least in my, um, why it says it right there, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. So whenever that designation of prophet comes up, it kind of means, at least to me, that others recognize that he was a prophet of the Lord. And also there's another reference that we're going to see, if you wanted to skip ahead, if you have your Bibles, to uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 9. So it's the first and the last verse um, of chapter 3 in the same book. There's mention of Habakkuk um, using an instrument called uh, Shignioth. I'm sure I'm butchering the name of it. Um, so he alludes to an instrument that this um, um, that, it, that is supposed to be used. And then in verse 19, it again says something about his instrument. So the fact that he references kind of two musical references, one being to an instrument, or two, both being to an instrument, uh, he may have been associated with the temple singers. It's kind of what I, I read in one commentary. So just because of the fact that he alludes to these instruments, uh, he may have been part of the, of the Levites. I couldn't find any uh, reason not to believe that. So some scholars also have associated his name. Again, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of 
understanding of Habakkuk, how we don't know a ton about him. There's not a whole lot of history to, to dig up on him. But his name uh, shows up twice in this book alone. Uh, and it, in Hebrew, his name kind of means embraced. So it was said that his name may mean embraced by God or embracer of Jehovah. So that's kind of a cool name. And, and you know, Pastor David has shared and some of the other assisting pastors from the stage how most every single name, well, every word almost, well, not almost, every word in Hebrew, there's got a word picture associated with it. Um, so it's pretty cool to know that he's got a pretty good, cool name. Embrace, Embracer of Jehovah or Embraced by God is Habakkuk's name. From the slide that I was showing you, Habakkuk prophesied during the fall from power of Nineveh. Nineveh being in Assyria. It was around 612 BC that we see Nineveh kind of falling from power and Babylon starting to rise in power. Also in this time frame, about seven years later, by 605 BC, so we're going to the right on this timeline, um, Assyria and Egypt uh, by now have been defeated by Babylon at a battle called Carchemish. That's how I said it, <laughs> Carchemish. Um, so Assyria, Egypt are being wiped out now, as will Jerusalem eventually by the Babylonians. And Habakkuk is seeing a lot of this wickedness happening, hearing about it at least. So Judah's days were numbered, and Babylon's power was rapidly starting to expand and ex expand around the known world. Also during this time, about 609 BC on this timeline, uh, we can see... Well, this timeline is slightly skewed from some of the dates that I, I just noticed that. Uh, I, was, I saw somewhere a reference of King Josiah what well, died in actually 609, but it so um, Josiah here back at 655 or 650-ish BC, now, living in that time frame. So you, again, this timeline is not perfect, um, and I had written down 609 as the time that King Josiah had died. Um, but during King Josiah, remember his reign was uh, a very good reign in the sense that he brought national revival back to the kingdom. And remember, you can see on the timeline there who his father was, the king before Manasseh, one of the most evil uh, kings of that time. So on the heels of a wicked father, we have a, a righteous good son. Um, and so Habakkuk knew of those reigns and lived through probably the end of Josiah's reign. So we see an era of great things coming to an end inside the kingdom of Judah. So he's now starting to see the wicked start to prosper inside of it, because after Josiah, we get more evil um, or, or bad kings taking over after Josiah. So um, Je Jehoiakim is most likely the leader king at this point in time. And he did not follow the Lord like Josiah did. And outside of the kingdom of Judah, we have a lot of wickedness happening as well. So Habakkuk cried out against the violence, lawlessness, and injustice he saw all around him, whether it be inside the kingdom or kind of outside the kingdom on the outskirts. And this book contains uh, two prophetic laments by Habakkuk. We're going to read through them because they're both in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and then chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And those are basically the, the two sections of scripture where Habakkuk asks these questions of the Lord. The two questions that we had just looked at a second ago here on this slide. While people, um, so in summary of this overview, uh, while people may be seduced into wickedness by the allure of power and success, a glorious future does await those who do submit to God. So those that are righteous and those who start to follow God, there's, there's going to be a glorious future for us. But for those that are wicked and have um, promulgated that type of lifestyle, there is going to be justice uh, coming their way. So all wrongs will be made right, the wicked will be judged for their sinfulness, and the righteous will be saved. So that's going to kind of be the, the end result of what we're going to see in the book of Habakkuk towards the end, 
uh, after all these laments that Habakkuk brings up to us at the beginning of this book. All right, so with that said, that's uh, my short overview uh, to the book of Habakkuk. So we're going to just go in and start with verse 1. We're going to do the whole chapter tonight, so it's only 17 verses. Um, and next week we'll be uh, doing all of chapter 2. So back at uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. So back to the first, second word here. Uh, the word burden uh, may also be translated as oracle or judgment. Remember that Habakkuk is now prophesying after living through the reign of Josiah. And Judah is possibly at this time being reigned by Jehoiachin or Jehoiakim, and the country is spiraling down out of control into wickedness, as we just kind of alluded to by looking at the kings and what's happening according to that timeline. And I just wanted to point this out again. Uh, we got Habakkuk there, Jehoiakim being the king, uh, possibly ruling at this time now in Judah. Habakkuk must certainly be longing for revival uh, as he pens this book. You know, he was so much used to living through the long reign of Josiah and things prospering and doing well. And he, I'm sure, liked that type of kingship happening rather than the, the other. Um, so it's something that he's really contemplating and weighing heavy on his heart. Lord, why are you allowing these things to happen? How long do I have to cry? So it makes you think and wonder... You know, how long has he been crying and wondering about the wicked things that he's been seeing going on inside uh, of Jerusalem, inside of Judah, and out? And even, you know, he has to cry out violence, and, and he will not save. But from these two questions, you will not hear, you will not save, we know those are kind of like rhetorical type questions because he knows and we know that God does hear. And he knows and we know that God does save. So he's just kind of throwing those questions out in a, in a state of anxiety and, and just wondering what is going on. I, I just can't understand why this is happening the way the things are happening. So in verse 3, Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. So you see these multiple little questions here. He hasn't got to his big question yet. But he says, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? So he's like just asking the Lord. You know, it's so like us when we get up in the morning or before we go to bed at night. We're kind of looking at our multi uh, social media or looking at our news feeds on uh, Facebook or the news or whatever it is that you may go to to see your news. And it's just one bad thing, one evil thing after another, after another, and after another. He's saying, Lord, you're showing, because remember in the verse 1 it says he saw these things. So the Lord, so there was some sort of vision that appeared to Habakkuk. Uh, and, and all it says is that word saw. It doesn't expound on that anymore. So I have to think that he, even though it doesn't say the, in a dream or in a vision, it, he just said that he saw. So was it truly a vision that he saw? Or was it just out of his eyes he was witnessing all of these different things? Um, it, it could have been a little bit of both. But here it's kind of alluding to the point that he seems like he saw multiple things over and over. The Lord was allowing him to see trouble and this plundering and this violence, this iniquity. And like he's asking the Lord, why, why are you keep showing me these things? How long do I have to see these things? Uh, and he's kind of, kind of tired of it, it sounds like to me. So again, Habakkuk was kind of unique in the sense that he really liked or enjoyed asking the Lord questions. Um, so, yeah, um, in verse 4. Therefore the law, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. So that's like another statement. He's saying, it seems like the law is powerless, and justice, it just never takes place. It never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteousness. Therefore perverse, perverse judgment proceeds. So where he says the law is powerless, uh, Habakkuk was just commenting that the hearts of the people were focused on material success 
rather than justice. And there's words that are used here like justice and perverse judgment that, that kind of speak of maybe the, the judicial system there in the area was not what it should be or not what we would hope it to be. Um, things weren't being weighted out properly in their court systems possibly. So there was much more influence going on just was it, uh, I'm going off topic here, but when you have uh, people that are kind of go to the Washington DC and they try to uh, lobbyists, uh, so the lobbyists you know, are trying to get their influence um, into the, the system and, and they have so much power uh, in Washington DC when they lobby and it kind of influence what true justice probably should be happening or taking place. And that's kind of what he's alluding to here. Uh, and then he uses the word wicked, for the wicked surround the righteous. Uh, but God's chosen people were committing and tolerating heinous acts through corruption of the courts, is what I was reading in one of the commentaries as well. So he's kind of alluding to that, and he's talking about perverse judgment proceeds. So he's actually saying, this is happening. There's perverse judgments taking place. True Justice is not happening like it should be. And then the word justice that he uses, or righteousness, I'm sorry, that he uses here. There were always people who were faithful to the Lord, a righteous remnant. Uh, you're going to find that uh, all through Scripture. And that he's saying, yeah, there are righteous here in, in the area of Judah, but there's just so many wicked people surrounding him, surrounding them and us, that we just can't get things done, maybe in the court of law. So the godly were restricted in what they could do and say because of the wicked people around them. And perverse judgment that's mentioned here, uh, the powerful people of Israel were just corrupting justice. Nothing was occurring as it should. In verse 5, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. So this is now the beginning of the Lord's reply. Um, the, the first question that, the first big question that Habakkuk had, if I go back to here, why does evil in Judah go unpunished or why did the wicked prosper? That's what those verses 2 through 4 were alluding to. Uh, and he was expounding on those and giving reasons uh, on why that was his main question. So now in verse 5, uh, we see now the Lord is going to re reply back to Habakkuk and Remember, during Habakkuk's time, Syria was declining and Babylon was on the rise. And Habakkuk uh, just got done asking God why he wasn't doing anything to stop the moral decline and corruption from continuing. And now God says, I'm doing something, but if I told you plainly, you would not believe me. So he uses this phrase, uh, for I will work a work in your days. So in God's mind, in Habakkuk's mind, this is something that is, uh, something ominous was on the, on the horizon or about to occur. He's about ready to tell Habakkuk what his plan for justice is about to be. And it's so different uh, that God even says, if I told you plainly, you just wouldn't believe me. But sit back, sit down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you anyway. And that's what the next couple of verses are going to be about, because the Lord's reply is just going to be all about telling us about who these people are. And he starts by calling them the um, Chal Chaldeans or Chaldeans. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. God controls all nations and uses them in his timing and according to his purposes. So the Chaldeans are the Babylonians, which are going to be, end up being led by King Nebuchadnezzar name that we're all familiar with and have heard before. The Babylonians are going to be used to chastise God's chosen people for their multitude of sins. And this is going to kind of lead into uh, Habakkuk's second question. Why on earth, Lord, would you decide to use these people to chastise your chosen people? Verse 7 and 8. They are chickens. Here again, the Lord is still speaking. The Lord is still explaining to Habakkuk. Um, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards, 
and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead, their cavalry comes from afar, they fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. So the Babylonians were far from humane, and they loved to use their raw power to dominate with no regard for other legal systems of the people that they conquered. Uh, the Babylonians' uses of horses and chariots made them fearsome uh, in the ancient world. So they just uh, came, I, I know there's other passages in, in the scripture that uh, refer to the Babylonians and how they just came storming into areas and there was just a loud, loud noise that had to be present with the horses and the chariots that uh, these people weren't used to hearing and seeing before. The images from the animal kingdom, you can see I highlighted those uh, animal names in red. So the horses, leopards, wolves, and eagles. Uh, these images were meant to present a vivid picture of the uh, possibly the ferocious nature of this new world power charging out of the scene here now in Judah. Um, so I'm sure, maybe not so much for us now, but these types of animals were probably back then not revered, but they were there's probably more meaning to them in the sense that, uh, well, back then, 650 BC, there were a lot more wild animals uh, around. And these may have been the types of animals that just spoke of speed and swiftness and strength and courage and savagery. I mean, especially the, the wolves and sometimes the eagles, even when they can attack out of nowhere to get their prey. Um, so that was the kind of the, the imagery of these Babylonians as they come upon to conquer an area. Verse 9, they all came for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind, and they gather captives like sand. So Habakkuk had witnessed violence in Judah, but Babylonians took pleasure in all sorts of violence. And the Babylonians, they took it upon themselves, and it was kind of a practice where they took their uh, um, conquered peoples uh, with little regard for them as individuals. Uh, there's explain something a little bit later when we get to the right verse, but they were very wicked in how they treated uh, their captives most of the time, just as the Assyrians were. Uh, but at least the Babylonians, they didn't kill everybody, they did a lot of relocation uh, of their captured enemy. In verse 10, so this is still the Lord um, talking to Habakkuk, explaining more about uh, these uh, Babylonians. And he says, they scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. So the Babylonians were apparently able to burst through any system of fortification uh, that they encountered, encountered in the cities that they conquered. Uh, they especially liked the use of heaping up earth or soil uh, against the city's walls to either break down the city walls or build it up to the height of the wall so that they could just enter the city over the top of the wall. And apparently the Romans learned something from the Babylonians because they used the same tactic many times, but the one that's probably most familiar with us because it's still in present-day Israel area, um, a place called Masada. And some of you may have uh, visited uh, this area. But Masada is where a lot of people ran to for refuge after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So I have a picture of Masada. This is the back side of it. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I, I, I physically walked to that very edge there where that ramp goes up, and just so you could look down on that ramp. Um, and over on the very uh, left-hand side, you can see where it kind of straight down and steps out, straight down and steps out, step, and then goes straight down again. There is where Herod the Great actually built two palaces for himself on Masada between the years of 37 and 31 BC. And on those area there, if you look at it in a different view, that's kind of roughly what they may have looked like um, back in the day on those uh, terraces, on those that area of Masada. And there's me and Margaret up on top of, <laughs> Very good. Up on top of Masada looking down. Um, so we were there. It was pretty amazing to look back and think that was 2000. Five, when we walked around that whole top there, and over in the corner up there, there's when we were there, they were still unearthing things. They were still excavating certain parts, and there's I don't know if you call it a temple or a building there. They can still kind of see a little bit, 
Um, and near the very edge, um, there was a place where they, I think it was Ezekiel chapter 37, 8, 37, 38, or 39, is one of those three chapters that they found scrolls hidden up there. In, it was, I think, the one about the dry bones. Um, so that would be 37. I think they found a scroll of that partial um, passage of scripture that was there with them. But this is also the place where, again, uh, this is way off my notes, I'm um, just trying to go from memory, but there was several, a lot of people there, so when the Romans were building this up, I got pictures of big cannonball type things, big stones, where they would, uh, I think the Romans were heaving them up onto the top, and then they couldn't really do much with them, so they just had them piled up there, and they're still there. You can see the, uh, these big earthen stones that were used as weapons. Um, anyhow, so there's a lot of cool things to see there, but there's actually a, coming down that ramp, they've got a fence on it so people can walk up and down it if you wanted to. We didn't, we didn't do that when we were there on the trip I went there. But that's pretty cool that that's what it may have looked like. And it's, uh, architecturally, that's probably a a, a nice summer resort area because of the, the heat in the desert at the time, that heat would have been rising and causing a nice updraft all the way up the side of that, uh, that mountain in the summer months and cause a nice breeze. And you can see there's probably a lot of open, open porticos, uh, porches area there where the king could go to this area and relax. Uh, just kind of a place to get away, a summer resort per se, with the Dead Sea in the background. Alright, verse 11. Then his mind changes. So this is the passage that I was alluding to earlier that is now pointing towards King Nebuchadnezzar. Then his mind changes, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. So I believe this is either a prediction of what will happen to the king of the Babylonians, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, or an actual account, because we believe Habakkuk and Daniel were contemporaries with each other. Just remember, from that timeline, Habakkuk and Daniel lived roughly at the same time. So is it possible that Habakkuk had heard about what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar? It, it, I guess it's possible. And then it was included in, his, uh, in this passage of Scripture. So if you remember back to this time, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was so proud of himself, he was walking around in his palace on one of his porticos maybe, and just uh, saying, wow, look at this kingdom that I built, and look at all of this stuff that is so majestic and cool. And while he was speaking, the Lord, a voice came out of heaven, and the Lord was, spoke to him and pretty much put this curse on him, for lack of a better term, and he became like a cow of the field. So a beast of the field for seven seasons, it says. So we believe seven years that he was just out with the beast, um, taken away from man, and his hair grew out, and his nails grew out, and he was just a wild animal at the time. So Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon? that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. Look at those pronouns. He's ascribing all of this to, to me, to me, to me. I did all this. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice from me. And, 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 and then continuing on verse 32 and 33. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of the heaven, till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. So, wow, it was just... His mind was kind of taken away from him. He was just like an oxen, like a beast in the field for seven seasons, seven times, we believe seven years. That's a long time. 
to be stricken that way. Verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. So here is the beginning of Habakkuk's second question. Habakkuk asks, are you not from everlasting? Which again is a more of a rhetorical question, meaning Habakkuk does know that God is from everlasting. But he's just talking out loud in a state of confusion, it seems like at this point. He's just asking those type of questions where he kind of already knows what the answer is, but he's just asking them anyway, because sometimes we just have to say things to get them out of our mouth, off our chest. I said, oh Lord my God, my Holy One, we shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment. He just can't not fathom and understand what's going on at this point. So Habakkuk's point was that God surely could have used a less dirty instrument than Babylon to accomplish his purposes in judging and reproving his own people. So Habakkuk is having the same problem that Asaph had in Psalm 73. He knew God is good, but the wicked are prospering. And he's saying, why, Lord, why? Why do you continue to let the wicked prosper? So let's read Psalm 73, um, verses 2 through 5. And again, this is Asaph um, having the same thoughts or tendencies as Habakkuk. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. So, again, just one passage of scripture from Asaph. That's kind of another person having the same thoughts as Habakkuk, just in a different time frame. And I'm sure there's other passages in Scripture that uh, represent that same connotation uh, or understanding, you know, God, why are you doing this um, this way? I don't understand. Please help me understand is kind of what he's crying out for. In verse 13, and here is Habakkuk's second question, essentially. You are of pure eyes and behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. So that last part is basically uh, his main question. Uh, why are you letting the wicked devour a person that's righteous? Why do you allow this to happen? So this was the ethical dilemma that faced Habakkuk. For the Judeans were less wicked than the Babylonians uh, who were being used uh, to judge God's chosen people. Back it points out what he knows about God and that God is so pure and righteous that he can't look upon or behold inequity or evil. And so this goes to ask the second big question, which I'm going to just bring up here so you can let it sink in. How can a just God use a wicked nation like Babylon to punish his chosen people? And that's the, kind of a question that so many people have asked over the ages. Verse 14 and 15. Why do you make men like fish of the sea? You know, still speaking of the Babylonians here. Like creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and they are glad. Habakkuk is getting more daring in asking God why he would bring these wicked men of Babylon like fish of the sea. Such a vast quantity. These creeping things acting apparently as they have no ruler. So just without malice, without thinking, they're just they just go in and destroy, destroy, destroy. Uh, the Babylonians were known for stringing people along as they were being moved or relocated by attaching hooks uh, through people's noses or through the lip of their mouth. And you can imagine it, would, it wouldn't take a whole lot of coercion. You had a, a, a hook, a big fish hook, through your nose or through your lip and mouth, through your jaw. Uh, you know, it wouldn't take a whole lot of pulling on that, that string, that rope, to get you to, to move and walk uh, without too much arguing going on. Um, 
But, may, but at the same time, imagine how painful that would be. Um, I mean, that's all pretty flesh and skin, I understand, but it's still got to be very painful, um, especially when you have it already through there and then the tugging on it taking place. Uh, I've never had an earring, so I don't know what that feels like to have you know, the ear of your load pulled on it if you snag an earring on something. Um, I'm sure our wives have had that happen before and maybe explained to you what that pain feels like, uh, but I, I can't imagine having something through your, uh, your nose or your lip. But that was something that they just, eh, this seems like a good way to get people to follow us. Let's, let's try this. we got all these fish hooks laying around. I can't use them for fishing anymore for some reason. They're, they're all rusted and stuff. Let's, let's use these. So verse 16. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and actually burn incense to their dragnet. Because by them they share, their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. So this verse speaks to the great pride of the Babylonians and all their devices of destruction, uh, meaning they had nets and these dragnets that they used. And they even burned incense to this dragnet. Uh, so these were probably most likely like a large fishing net that they would throw over people as they tried to escape. So they would prevent them from escaping. And um, just because I showed a picture of Masada, I remember being on the uh, Sea of Galilee uh, on a boat and they actually got to take out one of those nets and the guy was on the front of the boat and he kind of had it wound up in his arms type thing and then he would throw it out over the, the sea like this and it would just kind of go out there and it would spread out into like a 20 foot diameter as it fell on the water. And it was weighted on the edges so it would just kind of sink down and capture, as it fell down or sunk down, it would capture the fish. So these same types of nets or drag nets the Babylonians used, I'm sure as they're maybe riding along on one of their horse-drawn chariots, they would throw it over a group of people as they were trying to run away and scatter. And they would, they would capture them this way. And they, they loved their nets. And they actually burned incense to their drag nets. Um, because it was one of their, I guess, most easiest way to capture a group of people at once. Um, so they, they just um, loved it. Well, they, I can't speak to how much they loved it, but it sounds like they really enjoyed what they were doing and they made these things uh, so they could do them well. Verse 17, the final verse in chapter 1. They shall therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity. So Habakkuk ends by asking another question about how good could allow, how God could allow the activity of the Babylonians to continue. Proposing that surely God must want to punish the Babylonians for their pride. I mean, he has to assume that and think that just as you and I would. Uh, and Habakkuk keeps asking God, why would you bless the ungodly and prosper the ungodly? And we all know that eventually the Babylonians do get conquered and rightly um, get punished themselves. But that's for years to come before that happens. And so in the, in the present time, Habakkuk has no idea that that's going to happen. The Lord's kind of telling him that that's going to happen. But it's hard to believe that in the present situation. So with all of those questions that Habakkuk has brought up, uh, laid them out for the Lord to hear, and he sat there and listened to the Lord's reply about how God's going to use the Babylonians to, to, to punish Judah. Uh, and he still doesn't understand. He's still got questions. He's still asking these questions. And the same questions that we still ask today, I'm sure. But is it something that we really need to truly understand. It would be nice to know, wouldn't it? To know what the answers to all of our questions are. But we just don't have that privilege. Um, even in the big scheme of things, you know, in our, that's the big scheme of things. In the little scheme of things, you know, in our day-to-day -day life, you know, right now you could ask the question, well, what is work going to be like tomorrow when I go into work? And we have no idea. Uh, God's going to lay it out before us. But Habakkuk is asking these big questions. He wants big answers. And not getting big answers, and sometimes we ask big answers and big prayers, and we uh, may have to wait months or years for a prayer to be answered, and sometimes they may get answered quickly. But all along, we don't understand why God does what He does. So that's kind of my life lesson. I kind of reused it from a, a teaching before, but having a God we don't always understand is a good thing that we need to learn to be okay with. At least that's my words. I mean, if you can just, if you can truly wrap your mind around that, 
and be okay with that, that we don't need to know the answer to everything, and the way things are going to work out, the way things do work out, is because God ordained it to be that way, and there's, you know, to use the cliche, you know, there's something, there's a, there's a silver lining, That's how, I forget how the cliche goes, there's a, oh, there's a silver lining. Every cloud has a silver lining. There's always something good you can find in something. No matter how bad it may be, um, there's still something we can find probably that, that's good in that. Meaning, did we learn something from the experience that we were allowed to go through that was very painful physically or painful emotionally? Um, you know, we ask, as you're going through it, you're asking the big question. You're like, God, why are you having this happen? Uh, why are you allowing this to happen? I've been doing all these things good for so long, I, I, I thought I deserved better than this. So whatever you may ask in your mind, we just don't understand why God does what He does sometimes. Until it's done, and then we got maybe hindsight 2020 vision, then we can look back and say, ah, that kind of makes more sense now than it did then. I still don't understand it completely, but, I, but I'm okay with it now since whatever. Um, but yeah, if, if God was so small, basically, that we could understand everything that was happening in our life, he, he wouldn't really be a God worth worshiping, would he? he would, it need, there needs to be some unknowns in my mind that we just can't fathom or understand uh, for him to be a God worth worshiping. But that's that's maybe a, a, a weird way to say it, but I guess that's one closing for tonight. We're going to be going into chapter 2 next week. And uh, we're going to be going into uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, is going to be mentioned. And that's a verse that's uh, brought up in several other uh, passages of Scripture. Uh, so we'll, we'll save that for next week. And uh, I guess we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. And we we'll thank you for this blessing and going through your word once again. And Lord, we know that um, the Babylonians had their, their purpose and their time. To be used as your instrument. And Lord, I'm sure as they were being used as your instrument, Habakkuk, and I'm sure many others, were asking the same questions Habakkuk had. Why, Lord, why? Uh, are, are you doing this, allowing this to happen? Um, so Lord, I, I just pray that we would somehow learn from what Habakkuk is going through uh, 2,600 years ago and apply it somehow in our present day situation. To know that you do have a plan and a purpose to prosper us, to give us a hope in the future. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, allow us when the time is right to, to have a little portal, a little view into to why you're doing what you're doing. You just give us that encouragement as we go along in times of a struggle and trial. And Lord, uh, just, just bring us on board us to, to sense and to know you that you're there with us, that you're walking alongside of us through these difficult times, whenever they may come up. And, Lord, that may just be all we need, to just know that you're there, to hear your still small voice, giving us the encouragement or a word of wisdom, or pointing us to a certain scripture that answers the question that we have. So Lord, just thank you again for that, uh, that blessing, that time where you come alongside of us and encourage us. Lord, I just pray that you be with each and every uh, man in here tonight, Lord, that you bless them and protect them as they uh, go home tonight and just bring us all back together uh, next week, if not sometime before then, I'm sure we'll see each other. So we just pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.